with regard to the role of diet in the creation of IBD, first of all, my experience has been that there is no single diet that is an IBD diet. As a group, patients with Crohn's disease tend to respond differently to diet than patients with ulcerative colitis. But within each group, there are huge inter-individual differences, so that one patient with Crohn's might respond very differently from the next. And there are occasional patients with ulcerative colitis who actually respond in the way that patients with Crohn's disease respond. All researchers agree that these are the four important components. Uh, the first is genetic variations that govern intestinal barrier function, repair, and immunity. The second is alterations in the intestinal micro microflora. The third are required aberrations of innate and adaptive immune responses. And the fourth are global changes in diet, environment, and hygiene. None of these four components can by itself trigger or maintain IBD. So different and diverse mechanisms underlie IBD in individual patients. There's a lot of research going on at present into the genetic underpinnings of inflammatory bowel disease and bacteria in the gut that are associated with inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, there's a study that came out of this center, and I've seen other studies that suggest that the changes in microflora are largely the result of inflammation rather than the primary cause, although there are changes that may contribute to perpetuation of inflammation. At present, Crohn's disease has more genes associated with it than any other disorder that's being studied. Now, in this fairly recent study, which was very detailed, there were 163 genetic loci associated with IBD. 30 genes were specific for Crohn's disease, 23 for ulcerative colitis, and 110 for both. These genes regulated innate and adaptive immune responses, microbial pattern recognition receptors, it's the ability of immune cells to recognize types of microbes as pathogens rather than friends. Autophagy, it's a kind of cellular housekeeping. The differentiation of Th17 cells, which are involved in promoting inflammation, secondary immune responses, and the integrity of the epithelial barrier. And the breakdown of that integrity leads to this phenomenon popularly called leaky gut. A few years ago, gastroenterologists routinely said, well, there is no such thing as a leaky gut. I don't think anybody believes that anymore. Um, there clearly is. It's a result of inflammation, and it's a very complex phenomenon. What is particularly interesting in this work is that interactions between different genes. You know, there's so many genes that interactions between them and perhaps their epigenetic modifications, which are an envir environmentally induced modifications of genes, may produce, may, may produce the clinical presentation of Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis and may explain why one patient is different, so different from another there are some researchers who think this may explain why some people have specific food intolerances that others don't have. With regard to diet, researchers are looking for dietary influences that predispose to IBD, that are not the result of it. Um, there have been a number of studies done. The problem is, it's a little hard to know when you're doing a retrospective analysis of somebody's diet, when did they actually get IBD? And what was really the pre-illness diet? It can take 10 years before Crohn's disease is diagnosed. And usually ulcerative colitis presents itself a little more acutely. Uh, but that's a major problem. So unless you're doing a prospective dietary analysis, take a bunch of healthy people and you follow them for a few years, it's a little hard to know if maybe what you're picking up are changes that the person made in his or her diet because they were already getting GI symptoms. Nonetheless, these studies suggest that ulcerative colitis may be associated with an increased consumption of animal protein. That's the European Free Nation study. And with vegetable oils rich in omega-6 fatty acids. And that is the EPIC study, which is ongoing. Uh, and that is a prospective study. So I would say that, that has, that's a lot stronger than any other association. 
what are the vegetable oils associated with fatty acids, with uh, omega-6 fatty acids? It's corn oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil. It does not include olive oil. Now, Crohn's disease may be associated with increased consumption of sugar. Those were some early studies. Fast food, meat, and total fat, and inversely with fruit and vegetable fiber. And that really may be an epiphenomenon, because if you're starting to get diarrhea, you're going to cut back on your fruits and vegetables sometimes. Now, there have been a number of dietary therapies that have been studied in patients with Crohn's disease. These include enteral feedings, that is, defined liquid formulas that the patient takes instead of food. And there are two types of these. There are elemental diets, which consists of hydrolyzed protein or individual amino acids, or polymeric diets, in which there's intact whole protein. There are also specific food exclusion diets. There's something which is very big in the UK called the low flex diet. It stands for low fat, low fiber exclusion. It consists mostly of lean meat, poultry, soy, and rice. Yeast mold elimination diets have been tested in a couple of small studies. There's something called a semi-vegetarian diet, and there are vegetarian diets that are tried. And then there's a diet called the specific carbohydrate diet, which is a very prominent among consumers in North America. It was developed by a woman in Canada. There are websites that support it. There have been books written and cookbooks. Patients that respond best are patients with relatively recent onset, deeper fistulizing disease rather than more superficial disease, and or involvement of the small intestine rather than isolated colitis. They improve nutritional status but they also have direct anti-mucosal, anti-inflammatory effects. They're equally as effective in adults as in children, although they're mostly used in children because they allow children to avoid the use of steroids. The polymeric formulas with intact protein work as well as the elemental formulas. And no one's been exactly able to figure out why that is, because originally the work was done with the elemental formulas, and the, the thought was, well, we're going to rest the bowel. It, you won't have to digest this food because it's pre-digested. Turns out that that's not the reason that these work. Um, people who are on these diets have a reduction in an inflammatory marker called vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF. They have an increase in an anti-inflammatory cytokine called TGF-beta that plays a role in healing in Crohn's disease. However, when the diet is stopped, the relapse rate is at least 60% after discontinuation. So they're difficult for people to follow, and much of the time they don't produce anything except a remission while the person is on the enteral feeding. It's been shown that fat may influence the effects of enteral feedings. Most of the formulas that are successful are low in total fat content. The addition of high omega-6 fats may attenuate the benefit of enteral feedings. However, coconut oil or MCT oil, which is derived from coconut, does not attenuate benefit and may even enhance it and may have direct anti-inflammatory effects of its own. And omega-3 fatty acids do not attenuate the benefit of enteral feedings. I saw a, a, a survey of pediatric gastroenterologists and their use of enteral feedings. In the UK, it was about 50% of pediatric gastroenterologists use them routinely. In Canada, it was 60%. In the US, it was 3%. And the authors of this concluded it was not due to a difference in the knowledge base. It was really due to the training. That is, the Canadian and English gastroenterologists were trained in the use of enteral feedings whereas in the U.S. that was not very common. And there is more information on the website of the Foundation for Integrative Medicine, it's mdheal.org, and at a website called pilladvice.com, which I created to deal with drug supplement interactions.